welcome to Virginia Arts Waiting in the Wings. If you're familiar with the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra, you'll likely recognize our two guests. Maestro David Stewart Wiley is a beloved leader and musical ambassador of the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra. Next year will mark his 25th acclaimed season. While he's conducted top orchestras around the country and around the world, including Italy, Germany, China, and the Czech Republic, David made his triple debut as conductor, pianist, and composer with Boston Pops last year. Violin virtuoso Akemi Takayama is known worldwide for her musical artistry. Her performances have enthralled audiences throughout Japan, France, England, Turkey, Israel, and the U.S. She's currently the Associate Professor of Violin at Shenandoah University in Winchester. And closer to home, she's Concertmaster for the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra. Thank you both so much for joining me. We'll talk a little more specifically about your talents a bit later, but as you know, especially David, since he's been here before, we've been doing this series to kind of highlight the challenges that this pandemic has created in the arts and with the artists themselves. So David, I want to start with you because I'm, I'm interested to know how has COVID-19 affected the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra? Thanks for asking, Lisa. Well, we're hanging in there. We are able to do a bunch of online things and some things live in person and really just finding all kinds of collaborative opportunities during the pandemic uh, with our musical colleagues. As many of our viewers will understand, it's a difficult time for freelance musicians. And there was, there's been a lot in the press recently, just the New York Times had a big article on the challenges facing artists with almost 50% of freelancers out of work. But we are hanging in there. Uh, we have a really supportive community. Our musicians have been wonderfully flexible and collaborative and uh, none more so than my beloved colleague, Akemi Takayama, who's with us today, our beloved concert master and an extraordinary artist and teacher. Well, I know and absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, Akemi, I know you were in town uh, over the holidays because the RSO, David, you did put up performance together. In fact, it aired here, here on Blue Ridge PBS. It did air here. Um, so you have been sort of active doing some collaborations and really trying to get through this pandemic. Kemi, how, how have you handled this? Thank you for asking because now more than ever, Having any performance opportunity is so precious. And I, I'm so grateful for any opportunity that I'm given. Uh, so when the Roanoke Symphony uh, at the, in the beginning wasn't sure, and then it became like really sure that we're gonna have a concert uh, uh, without the audience, I'm like, oh, this is so amazing. So uh, it's as a performer, it's such a tricky time because it's not like it's been on the calendar from last year. So we really don't know what, what's coming up. And then all the things that was on the calendar got canceled one after another. So I actually personally went a li little bit down downward, <laughs> um, kind of, um, and I didn't want to practice because I didn't have any concert in, on my calendar anymore. And then after doing a lot of different things, like doing a sourdough bread and a kombucha and doing the uh, gardening, which I don't normally get to do, so I got to spend time on things that I wanted to do in the past. So then by the time when the opportunity came to be able to perform, I was like, I'm refreshed and ready to share my art. But it, unfortunately, it's not you know, very clear still, but you know, right. every opportunity we're treasuring. Well, I'm curious if it, if the sort of the pause, the stop that happened, did it sort of mentally affect you? Did it, did it bring you down? Did it, you know, David, let's, let's go with you. I mean, did it, did, did it bring you down? Like it has a lot of performers and artists. That's a really good question. I think like a Kemi, I found not only musical outlets like composing and playing my piano that make my heart sing, but mm -hmm taking long walks with my wife and our teens. And I was talking with my uh, colleague, cellist Zul Bailey, just the other day. Uh, he's been with us and we've recorded some CDs together. And he said, normally during the year, he's on the road, you know, more than 200 to 250 days a year. And he has every day been able to take walks with his teenage kids. And certainly for me, our, our son is in his last year of high school before going off to college. And 
playing basketball in the driveway, playing chamber music together. He and I have been able to perform together. Nothing more precious than that. And we'll record uh, anthems for church. I'm able to do a lot of online things with the local schools, retirement homes, chamber of commerce, on and on and on. So all of those things are things that are about human connection. And for someone like me who is an extrovert, I miss being around people. And Zoom isn't the same, but I still have that connection and it gets me out of bed in the morning and I exercise and I practice I, and then find things to, to um, make the world a better place. Well, you were talking a little bit about teaching and visiting and performing for, you know, Zoom, whatever the case may be. Both of you, in essence, do teach. Um, Akemi, I want to start with you because, uh, you know, I know that uh, you, you got your music degree in Japan and uh, you started very early. I mean, my goodness, your performance career started at what, 15? <laughs> yes. Partially because, my parents, uh, partially because my parents are both musicians and they set it up things that uh, I, I would have enjoyed, I think. Yeah. Well, so now you're in the, in the United States, in Virginia particularly, and now you're teaching. So you, you studied in Japan, but you're teaching here in Virginia at Shenandoah University. Talk a little bit about that experience of teaching, because I love the fact that you're able to offer one-on-one -on -one instruction. Yes. Uh, however, I was kind of chicken out going to the, my small room teaching in person. So I, I did most of the teaching on, on by Zoom, which right. um, was very interesting because you will be able to record and I will be able to send my students the recording. So they are like listening to themselves, which they don't normally do in daily basis. So they're like, wow, I don't sound good <laughs> <laughs> so they actually learn to play. Uh, however, today I just came back from an athletic center at Shenandoah, Conservatory, at Shenandoah University where I teach, where a vaccination is going on, mm -hmm. COVID vaccination. Wow. And so they asked for volunteers. So I just went to perform with my student. So we did a duet and in person. So audience missed the, the vibration of, and the sound of the live music. So right, right. that was just a win-win situation. We enjoy performing and they enjoy hearing us. So, yeah. yes. and so go ahead. To, to uh, dovetail on that as well, one of the other opportunities that we've had with the symphony, um, words cannot express our great gratitude to our healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. And we have been having musicians performing for the healthcare workers at the changing in their shift mm -hmm. uh, at... Uh, Carillion, we have a partnership where we provide music for them. And in retirement homes, since it is not safe to have people come together, do performances that are broadcast over the closed circuit television so that the residents connect with us. And this is just an extension of the long, long partnerships that we've had with the Roanoke Symphony for many, many years. So we have a memory care program and local retirement programs in retirement homes that we do and finding ways that music more than many other things really accesses people's emotions and makes them happy and brings them back to a time when we can be together. And so the privilege of having that now more than ever is so present in my mind. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think that's one thing. One of the things that I've found in doing this show is that artists, performers, they're finding other ways to give back to the community. If you can't perform right now, then find other ways to, to really be, uh, you know, a, a, some joy, to add some joy to people's lives. And I think you, you're both doing that very nicely. Uh, Akemi, I want to go back a little bit because uh, I know we're in the middle of the pandemic. I know things kind of sort of turned um, you know, pivoted when it came to the teaching, especially at Shenandoah University. I'm curious if, if the way that you learned in Japan and the way that teaching and learning takes place here in the United States, I'm curious if you found any kind of big difference in that either teaching or learning of the violin that you teach. I feel like you opened my brain and saw what I was thinking. <laughs> Because uh, I constantly think about that. And uh, 
for teacher, there's always teaching philosophy that we think about. And I find myself thinking like, this is it. And then a few years after that, I always kind of revise that what's my philosophy. I think uh, in the beginning, I thought being friendly, being open, being trusting relationship would form a good relationship. Now I start, as I age more, I start thinking my students uh, young, getting younger. <laughs> um, uh, they are um, more, they're a generation where they use more, you know, computer and stuff too. So they are, they sometimes uh, need a, a lot more encouragement. Mm. Um, they question themselves sometimes. And then so all I just, you know, connect with them and really try to reassure, you know, that's more important, it seems. Uh, and then to be able to do like a slow, repetitive, like boring work is meaningful. Like I have to kind of, you know, slow down rather than say, do this, do this, do that, do that. Because if they don't see why they're doing it, it really doesn't come with a tangible result. So it's, it's tricky, it's tricky. But I think that in Japan, if I say, do this, do that, then the people do it without really thinking about it. Oh, wow. It's, it's a simpler, it's, it's, I guess it's a, or people obey more for the authoritative figure where in America, uh, they will challenge you, like, why do I need to do this? And so I have to say, well, because you can do this and that. And once they understand, they are like very, very creative. So it's an wow. interesting combination. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I would have never known that. And I saw in one of your uh, interviews when I was doing some research that you you tend to to be more like a mother figure to your <laughs> students is that true yes um because for me if your mind is not healthy then you cannot give yourself 100 percent. and mm -hmm. being a teenager it, they, they always wonder they question they're not very trusting of themselves like you know you can see them by the moment they come into the room i know they had a great week or not so great week and being a nurturing community, um, you know, encouraged by the school, we will really try to get the student. And then when they really feel like the teacher cares, understand you, and then they really trust what the teacher says, then they respond. So it's very emotional thing. Mm. Hmm. Fascinating. David, I'm curious, what, what has Akemi brought to the table per se, uh, to you as a conductor and to the orchestra as a whole, what does she bring that, that fascinates you or that you enjoy? There are so many things I could say, but I want to first tell a story. Unbeknownst to Akemi, um, a few weeks ago, one of her students taped her teaching <laughs> and she knows where I'm going with this. It's a beautiful story because it shows the kind of loving and creative presence that this extraordinary artist is. She was literally dancing along in the studio. The phone was kind of hidden down low and she's kind of dancing along and singing and playing along while the student is playing. And clearly it was what this young woman needed to be inspired. And I've observed this on many occasions. And this is just one example with one student. Coming to our Roanoke Symphony, the concertmaster is quite literally the leader of the string section and the relationship between music director, in my case, and our beloved concertmaster is a collaborative venture. She is the conduit by which we communicate our musical wishes. And during rehearsal, she is constantly talking to the other string principals, demonstrating for the orchestra what needs to be done physically with her bow or by talking to them, making suggestions. And she quite literally is like the head coach uh, along with the music director. And, and I think of it as an equal partnership because the conductor doesn't make sound, or at least shouldn't when we're doing performances and recordings, right? Other than the old grunting and so forth that Bernstein and Toscanini used to do. So that partnership is one of the most important collaborative 
partnerships in the symphony orchestra. And it is made extra special by the fact that she and I do recitals together. We've done recordings together with piano and violin. She has premiered some of my compositions for violin and piano. And we've done recitals with quartet, with symphony, she's done solos. And the final thing I will say is that she is living example of how a musical leader like her can go out into the community and be beloved. She does master classes. She and we partner in the schools on many, many occasions. And it's, it's one of the reasons why the Roanoke Symphony continues to be such a success story is because of her continued presence with us. Fantastic, I love it. Your number one cheerleader right there. I uh, can't true. And, yeah, David is amazing, and, and you know the fact that he just can talk about others and you know don't really think about himself. It just shows how much he is really into you know giving others you know the the beauty of arts. So I am very fortunate to be working with him because he can really guide us to the you know whatever that he envisions. So. Right, right, right. And and I'm curious to know from you, what does coming to Roanoke and coming to this part of Virginia, uh, what does that give you? What does the symphony give back to you, if anything? I love coming to Roanoke because we are, uh, we are, we've been here for a long time. The p- p- players that have uh, been playing um, I don't know how, how many years is the longest people, but for me, it's since 2004. So it's really friends that we've gone through a lot of things. We talk about things. So one of the favorite thing is we go out for lunch together, uh, we chit chat, um, or after the concert to get together. Those are right. the really great things because there are a lot of groups that are just to officially meet and play and then go bye-bye and really do not blend with each other. But we are not like that. We really click with each other. And uh, I think it shows in our playing, hopefully. Mm-hmm. What do you think, David? Absolutely. And I think in many ways sets an example because of the deep educational collaborations we have. A lot of our musicians are also active in ways that our audience or the Blue Ridge PBS viewers might not see. Right partnering in the schools. For, for example, just this last week, she and I and uh, flutist Julie Hickox uh, were working with Jeff Midkiff, who is the director of the Patrick Henry High School Orchestra. And one of the ways we teach and we can mentor the young students is by example. So we recorded the solo parts of one of the great concertos by J.S. Bach. And we are going to have that video and audio Mm -hmm. Um, zoomed to the students and they will record their parts with us so they can watch a Kemi plays like oh my goodness so that's how you blow and you articulate and you phrase Bach and so it is the best of all possible collaborations we're mentoring the young students they learn by seeing an example of one of the great um, players and it's a win-win and That is one of the things I want to say is is a shout out to our local schools, the amazing work that our educators are doing, including the arts educators. And one of our most important responsibilities as artists are keeping and building those, those partnerships because now more than ever, creative outlet is what kids need. As we become more isolated, the ability to express one's emotion through the arts is absolutely a necessity. It's not a luxury. And now more than ever, the arts are needed. And those partnerships are just another one of the things that really get both of us excited and engaged with what we do as musicians. Well, that brings about another question then. Uh, Akemi, what what advice would you have for someone who might be wanted at, at any age, but let's talk specifically about young kids who are interested in maybe taking up the violin, what advice do you have for someone who, who's interested? Well, uh, interesting thing is that now I'm getting calls from uh, like a different states. Like uh, now it's not limiting to in-person anymore. Yes. So that if I know how to guide with just showing from here, how to hold the bill, how to, you know, 
use your body. If I can explain, then uh, students uh, could be from you know different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we didn't think about that that much. But now, you know, people <laughs> from Michigan, uh, you know, want to just set up lessons and all this. I feel like it, it's um, opening up for more possibilities in mm. a way. Uh, hopefully students can just feel good about seeing uh, the teacher on, <laughs> on the screen. That's the only downside. So, I mean, yeah. Well, it sounds as though the the pandemic um, has uh, has allowed for uh, interesting possibilities that you maybe didn't have before. Exactly, exactly. Uh, both from the teaching and the performance aspect of it. It's um, you know the driving amount of driving that I used to do was uh, uh, so much I can't even remember. Is that fifteen thousand miles a year or? 20,000 miles a year. That's but, a lot. Either yeah. way, that's a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that was yeah. a, every year. So my car mechanics know when I go, they'll just put me up front because I they know that I need to go on the next place right away. So anyway, now when I drive like two hours, I'm tired. <laughs> So <laughs> I don't have the, you know, built up energy anymore. But so now we have to think about what's worth making the trip, what you can do yeah. by, you know, meeting. Like sometimes I just went for meeting for driving long hours, but maybe right. I don't do that anymore. So, right, right, yeah. right, right. So uh, again, not knowing what the future holds in term, terms of this virus and the pandemic, what does the future hold uh, for Roanoke Symphony Orchestra? And David, I have to say congratulations to you because uh, you're entering your 25th season. Is that correct? That's right. This coming year, 25 years, it has gone by so quickly. And wow. I am so, so grateful for the community and the beloved partnerships that we that we have. It still feels after almost a quarter of a century like a honeymoon. We love living here, raising our families, making music. And, and part of it is that sense of family that Akemi was talking about, that when you can do what you love with people that you care about and respect, uh, our board, um, our administrative staff led by David Crane is extraordinary. The partnerships that we have with other arts organizations, the partnerships that we have with Roanoke City and, and the trajectory of the city and its support of the arts and education is one of the reasons why, why we stay here and why I stay here after, after all this time. I will say this, even before the pandemic, we, as the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra, tried to be entrepreneurial and innovative in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what has happened during the pandemic is accelerating the experimentation of some of the things that we were already doing. Of course, we were doing recording and online things, mm -hmm. but now by necessity, we've had to refine that. And from that will come new possibilities for the future. Uh, social distancing, as our viewers saw with our December string and piano concert, we had to work with having the orchestra separated on the stage by a lot of distance. That has forced us to listen in a different way. I was thinking about that with the Vivaldi that, uh, that you played with us as well. It was so different being so separated spatially when we had to record that, it forced us to really hone our listening skills. And mm -hmm. I think now more than ever before where we live in a world that is polarized on a lot of levels, that deep kind of listening that we do as musicians and that we as teachers try to teach to our young people is is amazing the value of silence right wow. that we feel we have to fill the space in a conversation all the time but music some of its most poignant moments are those silences before or after the piece never again will i take for granted applause we record without an audience what a weird feeling it is not having that applause there and the gratitude that's the most important thing 
And I did see that because I was there, as you know, uh, shooting some video of, of, of the performance and things like that. So I did see that and I, it was kind of strange to watch. So I can only imagine how strange it was to actually perform it. I have about a minute left. So, uh, Kemi, uh, what, what does the future hold for you? Uh, I know I, that's a hard question <laughs> because no one knows what's going to happen. Right. Yes. Um, but I think, um, we appreciate this uh, performing opportunity even more so that uh, I can even see myself in the video recording that mm. I, I each note means even more than before. Like before I would, you know, go and perform, but now it's like, I just want to take this moment to appreciate the sound, the, the beauty. So uh, I don't know if that's elevating the you know artistry or just mm -hmm. just that's in my mind only. I do not know. But if uh, we can just do only get better at what we do, and then um, uh, have a you know if we go back to the you know somewhat more normal circumstance, maybe the arts will be even more you know soaring. Mm. Right, right, right. Well, I'm sure both of you are very much looking forward to to having an audience, to getting that response, that immediate response from an audience. And uh, all of us here at Blue Ridge PBS uh, wish you the best of luck. We're here to support you. We'll get you on the air again if we have to for more performances. We'd love to see that. But for now, I just want to thank you for being here and uh, for, for sharing your experiences and what the future holds for the both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much for the support. And thank you all for watching as well. We'll see you next time.